notice that the fact of being aware is the common element in all experience, the common factor in all knowledge and experience. It runs, so to speak, ever present throughout all changing experience. The objects of knowledge and experience are continuously changing. Has anyone here ever had a, a thought, feeling, sensation or perception that didn't change, that didn't appear and at some point disappear? It is obvious that the objects of experience are continuously changing, continually appearing and disappearing. But the experience of being aware, or awareness itself, remains continuously present throughout all experience. In fact, the experience of being aware is the only element of experience that is continuous, or more accurately, ever-present. We think that our bodies are continuous. We think that the world is continuous and that awareness or consciousness is something fleeting and fragile that comes into existence and then disappears. If we stay close to the evidence of experience like a true scientist, we find that the opposite is in fact true. All that is known of the experience of the body or world is a series of fleeting and changing sensations and perceptions. The experience of being aware is the only experience that remains continuously present. In other words, the the body and the world borrow their apparent continuity from the ever-presence of awareness. The experience of being aware is always in the same condition. At breakfast this morning, whatever it is that was aware of your experience is in exactly the same condition as whatever it is that is currently aware of your experience. All your thoughts, images, feelings, sensations and perceptions have changed numerous times since breakfast this morning. But being aware has remained constant throughout. And not just breakfast this morning, but whatever you were experiencing yesterday, last week, last year, 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Being aware remains in the same condition throughout. Remember, when I speak of being aware, I'm speaking of your self, not some abstract consciousness that the Buddha or Ramana Maharshi had some special access to. I'm speaking of the, the very awareness with which each of us is now aware of our experience, commonly known as I, my self. That, that which we, each of us, essentially is, is in the same condition now as it was when we were five-year-old girls or boys. It hasn't changed. It hasn't moved. It hasn't aged. No experience has added anything to it or removed anything from it. It is at once one with all experience and independent of all experience. Like the space of this room, it touches intimately everything that appears within it, but is utterly free from whatever appears within it. Thus its nature is peace. It stands to gain 
nor lo- to gain nothing nor lose anything from experience. It is inherently or innately fulfilled. Thus its nature is happiness. When I say its nature, I mean your nature. You're the essence of your own mind. Is innately peaceful, innately fulfilled. Not as a result of any particular experience. But a peace that is prior to all experience. The place to look for happiness is not in any particular experience, not in a particular kind of thought or a particular kind of sensation or a particular kind of perception. It's, it's the place to look for happiness is in the ever-present knowing of your own being. That, that, that's where happiness lives. In fact, happiness doesn't live there. Happiness is the experience of knowing yourself as you are. That, that's what peace or happiness is. So don't, don't expect to find happiness in any temporary object, state or relationship. It's not possible. It's not possible to find happiness there, to find lasting happiness there. The reason why we're tempted to think that happiness is derived from objects and states and relationships is that when we, we feel something is missing, we feel that happiness or love is not present, as a result of this sense that something is missing, we long to find happiness. And this longing takes the shape of a desire for intimate relationship, for instance. So we long to have an intimate relationship we're not really longing for an intimate relationship. We're longing for the happiness that we think will be derived from it. When we meet the other and join in relationship, our desire and our longing comes to an end. Yeah, Because we've, we've got the relationship that we wanted. As the longing comes to an end, the happiness that was underneath it all the time but was veiled by the longing shines so that the the it's not actually the acquisition of the relationship it's the cessation of the activity of seeking that it's like it opens a doorway into our heart and for a moment happiness shines thought imagines that the happiness is caused by joining with the other by acquiring the object or the relationship and therefore when happiness next seems missing we think oh I remember last time last time I got the object or the relationship I felt happy therefore I'm going to go for another object and that's what most people do ob- from object to object to object experiencing brief moments of happiness when desire comes to an end and at some stage it dawns on us that the happiness that we felt all through our lives was always the same happiness. There wasn't one kind of happiness when you got your first teddy bear. There isn't a teddy bear happiness. And then an ice cream happiness. And then a football happiness. And then a sex happiness. And then a uh, got my first job happiness. Or, There aren't all these different kinds of happiness. Each time we felt happiness, it was the same experience. There was a lovely moment with my son three or four years ago. I had just been shopping with him to to buy him a pair of goalkeeping gloves for playing football. And we came back home and I went into the kitchen to start cooking dinner and 10 or 15 minutes later, I I heard this rustling of a paper bag in in the room next door. And then he came running in. He said, oh, 
I love having new things. He didn't say, I love having my goalkeeping. I love my goalkeeping gloves. He said, I love having new things. It, it, in that statement, without him knowing in it, without him realizing it, there was so much understanding contained. Because it's always not the object. It's the next new thing. The teddy bear, the ice cream, the chocolate, the passing the exams, the intimate relationship, the first job, the house, the marriage, the children, etc. Et it's always, it's not the object we want, the specific object. Otherwise, we would just stay with it. No sooner do we get the object than we reject it. it the object that once made us happy now makes us unhappy or the relationship. or it's 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 having that moment of i've got it the newness and so what he said what he said is i love to have something new it was an expression a childish expression of i love the experience of my desire coming to an end because in that moment happiness shines that happiness why is it always the same happiness because that happiness resides in that which is always the same it's always there in you Seemingly veiled, that veiling sends us outwards in search of an object. We get the object, the search comes to an end, and the ever-present happiness shines for a brief moment. So look for happiness where it lives. Don't, don't look for happiness in an object. Don't spend the rest of your life looking for happiness where it can't be found. It's a waste of a life. Look for it where it lives, where it is and then spend the rest of your life sharing and expressing that happiness with objects, with relationships, with activities. So either I'm dampening down an expectation of happiness in other words, I'm because uh, there isn't a there isn't an unhappiness, and there isn't a lack, and there's increasing gratitude and joy and love and flow and 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 nothing looking for more than that. But in the last day of, as you or two as you've been speaking, it's been come something has been coming up to go. You don't even know, um, you have no idea of the 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 uh, limitless beauty and happiness that I am, and I'm just wondering. And as a, without that knowledge, there is always going to be a pull out to object. If 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 that if it's not the tr if it's not the truth in my experience of I am of that joy or completion that has been experienced in objects. Sometimes, then, when the knowing of our own being is described as happiness it sets up an expectation that the happiness that is being described or named is some kind of a positive state and this is this can be misleading in a way we should describe it more in negative terms what it's not rather than what it is and your description of it as the lack of lack well, the absence of lack is a is a good description because the, the absence of lack doesn't give us any positive state to aim towards the experience of happiness itself is 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 transparent and and formless when when the mind touches it it is relieved of a limitation or a contraction and that release of the mind uh, is often accompanied by signs by certain signs in the mind or the body for instance um, tears or laughter or an expanded state of mind or goose pimples or uh, th these are the after effects in the mind and the body of this uh, of this 
collapse into our true nature. Uh, and they're very pleasant. They, they are either pleasant sensations in the body or enjoyable, expanded state of mind. And because they're pleasant, they're very often mistaken for happiness. They're not the experience of happiness itself. They are the, um, the after effects of happiness in the body and the mind. So if we consider those after effects to be happiness, then when we hear that the knowing of our own being is happiness itself. We will presume that the knowing of our own being is some kind of happy state of the mind or the body. And that's a misunderstanding. So, at the same time, the word happiness is a good word to use for the knowing of our own being, because happiness is the name that we commonly give to that that we desire and love the most. In fact, if we think about all the terms that are used to describe consciousness, they're all definitions, they're all terms that describe what consciousness is not. Eternal means not in time. Infinite means not limited. Indivisible means not divided. Immeasurable means n it cannot be measured. Imperturbable means it cannot be disturbed. The, all these words that seem to be positive definitions of what consciousness is are in fact simply saying what consciousness is not. Because there are no words in our language. Our, our words are designed to describe objects. So that's why we can only say that consciousness is not this and not this and not this. I mean, But the word happiness, we have to be careful with the word happiness because it seems to attribute a positive quality or state to consciousness. In some ways, the word peace is more accurate because it's a little less colorful than happiness. It has less, peace is more, it's more neutral. It has less form to it. And this is what is meant by the phrase, the peace that passeth understanding. The, the reason why peace is qualified by the peace that passeth understanding is to make sure that what is being referred to is a peace that is, and passeth understanding means not a state in the mind, not something that can be known in the mind. Um, when you were speaking about the nature of happiness when it occurs between two thoughts or two um, perceptions or two feelings, I think I recognized it and sometimes it comes as a surprise. Even just when doing the groceries, sometimes I can feel this experience of happiness out of nowhere. And in other occasions, it seems like the same experience, but then I, it feels like totally boring. So it appears to be the same experience, but sometimes it feels like happiness, and at other times it feels like totally boring. Yes, yeah, so if it's boring, it's not happiness, it's a blank state. Ah. But if it's happiness, it's a taste of your true nature. And what is the blank state? It's just a, a blank object, your screensaver. It's not, it's not yet the screen. It is, it is, it is the screensaver that, that ex seems to exist between your emails and images, but is not yet the screen. So you have thoughts and feelings, those are the emails and the images. And behind your thoughts and feelings there is a blank state, that's your screensaver. And behind the blank state, but the blank state is, is boring, just it's an empty object. And then behind that is the true peace and happiness, which is your, your transparent screen. And, and so this, this moment of boring, is, is, is that the sort of um, 
can it be followed by the sensation of happiness or is or is it something totally different you could ask yourself well, the experience of boredom is just a uh, it's a subtle object it, it's a blank object it, is it still uh, mind activity it's still mind activity uh -huh. you know if you buy a, a, a new apple mac the, the the screensaver is is always turquoise there are not yet any images or emails but you're not yet seeing the screen as it is. The screen itself is transparent, but when you look at it, it's pale blue. So it's still a subtle... It, it's, 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 it's a subtle colouring of consciousness. In other words, right. it's still a subtle activity of the mind that is mim mimicking the presence of consciousness, but is not ah. yet the true piece of consciousness. And my, and very my, ego, my ego wants to know if it's on the right path should I continue with this boring uh, No, if you're stuff. experiencing boredom, you're not on the right path. <laughs> <laughs> boredom is always an objective experience, a yeah. blank, dull, objective experience. Yeah. It's not yet the peace of your true nature. So yeah. when you're, and you know that because when you feel bored, there is always an impulse to avoid it. Yeah, there's resistance. Ha have you ever had the impulse? Has anyone here ever had the impulse to avoid happiness? <laughs> Where would you want to go <laughs> from happiness? So that's one way we, we know whether it's real happiness. There's no impulse to leave the now, to, to leave the experience. Whereas boredom, by definition, we always want to replace it. You experience boredom, what do you do? You reach for your iPhone or you reach, go to the fridge or whatever it is. There's always the impulse to avoid it. And could you say that boredom is kind of a signal to... Is, is it totally the, the wrong direction? Yeah, or it, is it, it, boredom is just the other side of expectation. It's a signal which tells us your happiness is still invested in the future. The boredom is basically telling us what I don't like what is present, I want what is not present. It's mm -hmm. another form of expectation. Kind of it's subtle suffering. Not so subtle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. What, what I want is not present now. Yeah. It's I believe that if I do certain actions yeah. or have certain experiences, what I seek will become present in the future. So I'm still making an effort to yes. grab has happiness. And the, all we could ever find in the future would be something objective. Mm -hmm. So if we feel bored, that boredom betrays the belief that our happiness is still invested in objective experience. Okay. If it's not present now, it's not worth going for. Okay. If it's not present now, it's not worth going for. If you take the activities that the separate self wants to escape into and, and ask what is the separate self trying to achieve by escaping into these activities? What it's trying to do is merge with that particular object or relationship. In fact, that's what anyone is trying to do in the process of desiring an object for the sake of happiness. The person is trying to merge with that object or person. And it is in that merging that the separate self loses its separateness and as a result tastes briefly happiness. So even in conventional in the conventional desire for objects, substances, activities, relationships, all the separate self is really trying to do is lose itself. Is to lose itself in the object because the separate self intuits that if I lose myself in that object or that substance or that experience or that relationship, I will taste the happiness for which I long 
and the separate self is quite right. When it does merge with the object or the substance or the activity or the person, there is an experience of happiness. The only difference is that the separate self that es tries to escape from what the experience that we are speaking of here believes that it remains as a separate self when it has the experience of happiness. So the separate self feels, if I go towards this, ob if I go towards this non-dual, on this non-dual path, I, I will dissolve as a separate self. So instead of that, I'm going to go in the opposite direction towards happiness, because it towards objects, because then I can have the same experience of happiness, but I can remain as a separate self to enjoy it. But in fact, that never happens. As soon as the self merges with the object, the substance, the experience or the person, it briefly dissolves. So even in the conventional fulfillment of a desire, the separate self comes briefly to an end. And as a result, happiness is experienced. So the separate self is going to die whichever way it goes. If it wants happiness, it has to die, whether it goes via objects or whether it goes the direct path. Happiness is the dissolution of the sense of separation. That's what happiness is. Whether the separate self requires an object to bring about that dissolution or whether it goes directly to its source, the difference is that if it goes via an object, its happiness is dependent upon that object and it will become addicted to that object. It will want to go back again and again to have the same taste of happiness. Whereas if it goes directly to its source, it's not dependent on an object. In other words, it, it, it is causeless and it is available at any time. So it is that fear of annihilation which... It's going to, it's going to die whichever way it goes. It's, as a Sufi friend of mine said to me when I told him 10 years ago that Ellen and I we're getting married. He said, you'll regret it if you do, and you'll regret it if you don't. <laughs> it's the same. The separate self is going to, if it wants happiness, it's going to die whichever way it goes. If it goes via objects, it will merge with the object and briefly die, and happiness will be experienced temporarily as a result. Or if it goes in the other direction, it will dissolve, and the same happiness will be experienced, but it will not be dependent on an objective cause. In other words, it will be the source of lasting happiness. And is there a, a time where that, if we keep exploring this path, a time where that, uh, that fear dissipates, that fear of annihilation dissipates, and that separate self is not trying to escape anymore? Yes, it becomes clear after the while, after a while that as the sense of separation dissolves, we don't lose anything that we really value. It, it's not our self that, that disappears. It is an apparent limitation of our self. John Smith doesn't disappear when King Lear disappears. All that disappears is, is an apparent limitation of John Smith. John Smith loses nothing of value. He just loses an, an apparent limitation. What does King Lear lose? His suffering. It's all he loses. Nothing, he loses nothing of value. The self of King Lear is the self of John Smith, and that is not lost. That doesn't die. So sometimes in the literature we hear of the death of the separate self or the dissolution of the separate self. This is misleading. There is no separate self. There is no King Lear. King Lear is just an imaginary and temporary limitation of the only self, if we can call it a self, that truly is, which is John Smith. And that never goes anywhere. That doesn't die. It is just relieved of a limitation and it shines as it is. That shining is the experience of happiness. <laughs> <laughs>